We're the most creative, uh, connected species that ever roamed this planet. But yet, with this, create, uh, this connection, we're also the most disconnected to our environment. We've evolved into a species that is more operating in the virtual than in the reality. I have a friend who loves to ride horses in video games. He hates horses, but he enjoys riding them around in the wilderness. But I'm imploring everyone today here to bring us back to a more wild side. We get our food from supermarkets. Everything is very easy. It's all at our fingertips. But there was a time when we had to work for our food. We had to use our brains and our strength. And we had to find our food. It wasn't just there, waiting for it to be picked up. And architecture was more kind of uh, a part of its place. It wasn't uh, about what is so beautiful in a magazine or, or selling. It was more about survival and using the materials that were there. There weren't architects, there were builders, and those builders built with what was around them. They also were building more connected to nature. You know, we, with our technology, we are kind of disregarding the climate and really just pumping in more technology and more energy to help us offset the climate that we have. So here, in pr more civilized, uh, earlier civilizations, people were actually tying in with the rise of the sun and the setting of the sun and the moon. These moments were magical. Who knew if the sun was going to rise the next day? So I became very aware of these things when I was asked to do projects in very remote locations, such as Costa Rica. And I became fascinated with trying to make the architecture disappear, to make it slightly more primitive, to blend it with the land rather than merely putting buildings on the land, to use the beauty of the sky, the flora, the fauna, the materials, and to weave the building in with its setting. The dream being that eventually the building may disappear and be surrounded by the nature that it's celebrating. So the idea behind this architecture was to help us connect with the place and bring us closer to nature, which is, to me, the star of all our work. This is an image of a temple in Cambodia that had been overcome by nature. Uh, in Qatar, we worked on a, a spa that was embedded in these incredible sand dunes. The idea was to create a monumental yet silent architecture that was invisible from the outside and sunken within the earth. In Jordan, we were asked to do a resort in a, the most incredible desert in the world. It uh, almost looks like Mars. And here, we were able to use 2,500-year-old technology to build caves that are embedded uh, in the earth and to align buildings with the rise and the setting of the sun. But it was all about connecting. It was all about connecting with the people. This is a tribal leader who became very connected to me. Uh, so it, it was very important for me that this work continue. And I'm not a big wine drinker, but I was fascinated by the notion of terroir, which is about getting the flavor of a place through the wine, how the wine is flavored and, and really experienced through the place, through the soil. So I was wondering, could architecture and making places have the same uh, experience. So these are two projects, and as well as the life that has been designed uh, with the project. This is a house in Colorado that has been uh, built out of 300-year-old barn wood, uh, local stone, uh, all the metal and other things were manufactured near the area. But it's really about creating a, a special moment that's connected to the mountains. Um, you know, this is a, a painting that's made out of local moss, and really connecting to the, the, this wonderful mountain setting and always framing nature. So our work is, is always about celebrating and really connecting with the beauty of the world around us. So here you can see just different moments and how these moments can start to become life. Architecture is not about incredible forms for me. It's about creating these incredible experiences and how these experiences can help us connect to place, connect to our friends, connect to each other and let architecture disappear within the natural environment and let the beauty around us really uh, celebrate it. So the idea here is also how do we connect to our local food source? Because this became a, a very important uh, feature uh, in, in our work is how to build the entire ecosystem. So here it's about um, finding trout in the streams and turning that into wonderful dishes or foraging through the fields and collecting flowers for an incredible bouquet. All these things are around us. Or uh, hiking on a trail and finding wild berries that become fruit roll-ups or jam. 
these things are all around us, and we, we're really not, by looking into our phones, we're actually not really looking and seeing what's around us. So it's very important for us as you know, enlightened species to really figure out ways to connect, to um, learn from our environment, to learn from the native people. This is foraging for, for mushrooms. I, how many times I've walked through the forest and seen these mushrooms and, and didn't even know, thought there was some sort of fungus, but they're actually incredibly edible and they're um, very potent uh, for health purposes. Or searching for porcini mushrooms. When you find these mushrooms, this is my son collecting 30 pounds of porcini mushrooms in a couple hours. There's something primal that connects us with the place. There's this, like the endorphins and our, the way that our bodies have been programmed uh, over time and really making that part of the experience. Or going to find eggs with the chicken and connecting with your food source and seeing the difference between store-bought uh, chicken eggs and, and as well as the uh, more pasture-raised chickens or going to milk a cow and turning that into butter or homemade ice cream. So these experiences are not just in the mountains, they could be in the islands, but also in the cities. This is another project that we uh, completed in, in the Bahamas. And it was about the architecture being connected to the place, about celebrating the views, about framing nature. And if we did our job, the architecture would disappear. And there's also this fascination about an elemental nature to the architecture, that it's very simple, very powerful. It's embedded in the jungle. Trees that were there are growing through the architecture. The buildings are reminiscent of buildings that have been built on the island for hundreds of years. But it's always about the framing of nature, the celebration of the sky. These are the things, they're, they're free, they're out there. I don't know how many of you have like been watching the sunrise or the full moon last night. But it's spectacular, and we as a people have gotten so disconnected from this because we're busy focusing on other things. So I'm asking everyone here to reconnect with the beauty around us, to let our world be more with nature rather than on top of nature. So here you can see the sun becomes a beacon and marks the time as it flows through the house, and almost like inspired like a, a, a work of art that the architecture is really about framing sky, about celebrating the beauty this is a, a full moon, actually unadulted by, uh, by, uh, un by Photoshop. It's actually the actual full moon, and you can see it here. But so you see how the house is actually aligning with these moments, similar to the way that these ancient civilizations worked with their architecture. And then the framing of the jungle and letting the light come through and letting everything else disappear and become a backdrop. So there's so much color there, it's kind of hard for me to even put colored fabrics and other things in, in the work. That the, the beauty of the place is surpassing everything that I can do as an architect, and it's really about celebrating that place. And even if you squint, the house looks like it could have been there for hundreds of years. Uh, this is other kind of food adventures that, that we've had where um, the kids call this nature's candy. It's, it's from the trees. So when the kids connect to the place and are getting the food, there's a greater appreciation. Sugar cane becomes an addictive... Uh, pastime, but once you start munching on that, you, it's hard to stop. Uh, this is tamarind and uh, creating jams from tamarind uh, or juice out of that. Uh, watermelons become you know, wonderful salads. Um, pina coladas from uh, picked pineapples. Bees providing honey for the kids to nibble on. Uh, zapadillo is a, is a local fruit over there that becomes a, a pudding. And bananas, of course, become banana bread. So these things are, are all around there. On the, and, and the native people sometimes forget it. Actually, the Bahamas imports $3 million worth of bananas a year, and yet they're growing right outside people's doors. So it's not just about educating people here, but also educating people in, in other locations. Coconuts become uh, turned into cooking oil. Uh, and then the idea of hunting is something really important. This is a lobster hunt going with a spear and finding lobster, turning it into a, a wonderful a bake on, on the beach, uh, actually going through people's garbage and finding things that can burn to make the fire. Uh, funny enough, the, the, the people on the island are, are on their porches on their laptops uh, with their Wi-Fi, and I'm going through their garbage uh, getting their, their debris, so they have a very uh, big surprise. Uh, collecting the seaweed from the ocean so we can cook with it and then digging a hole, engaging the, the, the family in the entire process, 
and putting the lobster in the bay, closing it up, and, and making an incredible uh, feast uh, that brings together and connects us to the, to the world around us. So the idea here is to really go a little bit wild, you know, get connected to the place, um, and really disconnect from the virtual and connect to reality. Thank you.